something totally unique. <laughs> that was a mistake. Um, what readers want, and this is actually true in, in terms of songs, movies, television shows, um, and if you're curious about this concept, I highly recommend a book called Hit Makers by Derek Thompson. He talks about the human brain loves fluency. It's thinking that feels easy uh, because it's somewhat familiar, and the human brain, I hope I'm getting this right, attributes um, that easy feeling, the fluency of it, to the quality of the idea. Uh, so a familiar surprise is always the goal. Number two, come up with a hook. The hook is what makes your spin on the trope a must read. Um, I, I have a group for authors and I often give feedback on blurbs and one of the things that I see over and over again is a great blurb for let's say a single dad and nanny romance, but it sounds like every other single dad and nanny romance because it's not specific enough. So the hook is something that's gonna get a reader excited to read your single dad and nanny romance. Number three, try to write your blurb before you write the book. I know this is hard. And get the tropes up top. Get it above that read more line on the Amazon product page. Number four, come up with ad copy before you write the book. Use the Facebook ads library to do your research. Go look at other people's ads and, and see what, the, what copy that they're using and don't, don't imitate it, but let it inspire you. Um, and number five, keep it simple come up with a concept that you can explain in 10 seconds. The truth is that you will have far less time than that to get the click. Um, these are hard things. This is hard work. And sometimes even I can't write a blurb before I get into chapter one and noodle around a little bit, and that's okay. What you want to avoid is getting to chapter 35 without a sense of what it is about this book that will appeal quickly and easily to readers. For many of you guys, it could be your name selling your book, uh, but unless you're Colleen Hoover, there are still people who haven't heard of you. <laughs> There's still room to level up. If you are Colleen, I don't know how you level up from there. <laughs> You'll have to go to Mars. So I wanna talk Packaging for a moment, we know how critical a cover is. It needs to communicate multiple things to a potential reader and it has to do it quickly. Each element of the cover subconsciously delivers a message about the book's content and tone. The photo, the font, the colors. And certain elements are associated with particular subgenres and serve as a sort of code that the reader understands immediately. So if you're a reader of epic fantasy, romantic comedy, military science fiction, paranormal romance, historical fiction, billionaire romance, or psychological thrillers, would you, would you need more than one second to know which of these books was for you? No, because these authors know their niche. They are communicating without what their book will deliver within using everything from title, font, colors, and imagery to convey that message. This is a question that I get a lot. So why didn't I put a dude in a suit on this billionaire romance? Um, and I'll tell you why. I knew that if I put the dude in the suit, which is standard for billionaire romance, on this cover, it would signal immediately to billionaire romance readers, hey, this is a book for you. And there's a lot of voracious billionaire romance readers out there. But I didn't do that, and here's why. Reader expectations. This isn't a typical billionaire romance. So my, my hero did have a billion dollars, but he, uh, he was not the dominant alpha boss type. And I worried that it would not meet reader expectations, and I would see that in reviews from readers who felt misled um, if they even bothered to finish the book. Um, and I don't have anything else for those billionaire romance readers in my backlist. There are authors who just write series after series of billionaire romance and make a very good living doing it. And more importantly, I needed to meet the expectations of my current readers and other small town readers who are coming to me because I do have plenty of books for them in my backlist. So no dude in a suit on that book. However, I don't hate money 
So I did put billionaire in my keywords. <laughs> it's in the blurb. Um, and it did rank number one in billionaire romance for a while. So I think Amazon um, did push it to billionaire romance readers and it converted reasonably well. But I chose to go in another direction with the cover on purpose, even if it meant I wouldn't automatically appeal to a pretty sizable group of, of readers. Okay, so common mistakes that I see. Number one, authors trying to be too original, and this is a mistake that I made also by ignoring the tropes. You don't have to reinvent them. Just give it a fresh spin, a new hook, Number two, authors trying to be too different with their packaging because they're worried about being cliche. I often have readers come to me with their sports romance, but they don't want to put anything sporty on the cover. <laughs> like, do you hate money? <laughs> put the hockey stick on the cover. Put the, put the baseball, put whatever it is. Uh, you need to signal immediately to those readers that this is a book for them. Number three, authors trying to write and market books for everybody. My book is awesome. It will appeal to everybody. Um, that's great, your book is awesome and funny and, and everything wonderful, um, but you've got to narrow it down and aim for a very specific group of people. Number four, a lack of market understanding, knowing what actually sells the book. I'm sorry, it's not your shiny lyrical prose. I'm sure it's beautiful, but that's another mistake that I see authors trying to show off their writing skills with their blurb. The blurb is, is just an ad for your book. You do want to communicate the tone that you're going to use, uh, but that's not where you show off all of your fanciest metaphors. Uh, and number five, inconsistency. And this is where writing in all kinds of different genres can hurt you. Uh, it leads to confusion and broken trust. Now, if you are a fast writer and you have time to um, keep two to three different brands going, um, like I heard <laughs> this morning on the panel, some of these um, authors have written like, 180 books <laughs> under, you know, three, four different pen names. I am in awe. That is amazing. I can't do that. I can only write and publish about three books a year. So for me, staying in my lane is, is what pays off. So here is a strongly worded email that I probably deserve. Uh, Dear Melanie Harlow, I call BS. Are you saying I can only write one kind of book for the rest of my career? That is boring. Susie Starface writes all over the place and she's so successful. I think my readers will follow me anywhere. They love my writing and that's all that matters. Sincerely, annoyed author. Dear annoyed author, that's fair. Good luck. <laughs> so I have this vision of leaving you with the image out of Field of Dreams and the idea that if you build it, they will come. But then I thought about it and I realized that's not necessarily true. You can do everything right, meet every reader expectation, and sometimes it will still feel like you swung and missed. So I'll keep the field because I love a baseball metaphor, but I'll leave you with this. A home run depends on a bunch of different factors and you don't have control over all of them but you do have control over the number of good swings you take. And I hope this workshop helps you take your best swing yet. Thank you. Okay, 11.43, are we good for some questions? No one's telling me no, so I think we're good. Um, I'm not sure if they, you, okay, you wanna use the microphone, perfect. We'll give it a shot, can okay. you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, this is a really refreshing uh, panel that you've had here because uh, I am also an author that can only do maybe two or three books a year because of career, family, various other things. Yes. Um, so one of the interesting things that you went over was your newsletter that you'd grown it to 170,000, but you do three books a year. So serving cake is also important, I'm sure, to your newsletter. Um, how do you come up with the content necessary to keep 170,000 people entertained or coming back for cake in your newsletter when you're only releasing every three? Because a lot of the panel was talking about how, oh, well, every week I'll just tell them about the next book I have next week. Right. Uh, and, you know, the, the 20 bu uh, books I have in backlist. Mm -hmm. What do you do to try to engage your 170,000 uh, readers on your newsletter? That's a great question. So I send a newsletter twice a month, every other Tuesday. and. I have just a very particular format for it. I, I will usually open with either a, a new release. 
or a cover reveal, but as, as we know, I only have that three times a year. So when, in, the, in January of the year, I will plan out on those Tuesdays, if I don't have a new release or a cover reveal or something new in audio to talk about, I make sure to schedule a promotion. All of my books are in Kindle Unlimited, so I use the five free days, and then I often book additional paid promo, like through wit Written Word Media. Um, to get the word out, but not every time. Sometimes I just put the book free for five days and then put it out to my newsletter. Um, I recommend books, uh, I do newsletter swaps. I'll recommend books that either I've read and loved or a friend and I are swapping. Um, she'll put me in her newsletter, I put her in mine. Um, and then at the very end, so my newsletters aren't really long. You know, I have the one thing that I open with, it's either a new release or the promo, a recommendation, um, and then at the very end, I just put a few personal details, what I'm working on, um, what I'm up to in my real life. I sometimes talk about, you know, if I did something, I have two kids, husband, um, and then I usually try to put a personal photo in the newsletter, and that's it. Wrap it up. See you in a couple weeks. Yep. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so I have a question about planning series. Um, mm -hmm. One thing I've kind of run into is by the time I get to book three, I feel like I've written myself into a corner on things and I'm a little frustrated with the characters in the world. So I would really love to know more about how in depth you get when you're planning series. Like, are you doing all the work in advance? Do you save some of it for when you get to those books? Things like that. A uh, friend and I were just talking about this at dinner <laughs> last night. So um, I wish I was more in-depth planning it out. I know the tropes, I know the character arcs, um, you know, the, the um, I just read a great book. It's a, actually a screenwriting book called, it's The Nutshell Technique. Um, and it talked about those eight elements to have any place for the writers in the And so that's kind of the line where they're all like, I would say all As everyone said, thank you so much for this panel. It's really great. Um, you mentioned that you have bonus scenes um, and opt-in links in the backs of your books for those scenes. Sorry, it's three-parter here. What, what types of scenes do you do? How good of conversion are you seeing? And what else are you using to like instigate people to sign up for your newsletter?
So I'm in a bit of a personal dilemma with my branding because I started writing a story or at least the series in the universe when I was in my teen. So I started clean. But then as I went along and I got older, I wanted to shift, not just, I wanted like I to continue writing the same genre, the same subgenre, the same tone, but I wanted to gear it older. And when you mentioned broken trust among readers, I had some of them when I told them that the next series was going to be darker and adult and have like violence and intimate scenes. She called it a bait and switch. And now I want to know what do I do because I don't want to remain in what I was before because I started to hate it and it made me want to quit writing, but I want to transition and I, do I just abandon my previous audience and seek something out or do I regret? So I double down. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I have a question about so much cake. Uh, so when you when your readers requested your next generation, you know, and that wasn't something that you had been originally planning. I said I would never do it. Right. So I don't know whether that was an easy thing for you to write or not, but we've all had books that are more difficult to write than others. And when you're writing something, you know it's something your readers want, but you personally are just finding it a difficult book to write. Do you have any tips or skills to, to keep it fun for you? Because if you're just slogging through this book you hate, um, what are your ways to get through that in a timely fashion? Yeah. Um, so it is emotional labor. Right? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it, it is sometimes, and some books just feel like a bigger slog than the others. So what I would suggest is that you weave in elements that um, are sort of talks about this. Like we all have those certain little things about in books that we love. Like I love an old house. Um, there's always somebody rehabbing antique furniture in my books. Um, or if it's the last one, I love antique show, my heroine watches it all the time. So I would say try to weave in those little tiny things that amuse you that might make it less of a slog. Um, and if you can pick what it is in all kind of book that feels so um, terrible, mm -hmm. um, it could be, you know, um, maybe there's just something that you don't want to write because it hurts. You know, um, and, and that is, so maybe if you're completely and totally fucked, mm -hmm. maybe look for a, a different like, way around it, a different storyline. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, I would say, yeah, just add in a few things that make you smile. Okay, great, thank you. Hi, I had a question about, um, you were talking about polling your current readers about what they expect and also what they want. Um, so I was hoping you could be a little more specific about the polling process and how you distill those things. Is it a gigantic list and you so which one and how do you discern?
wanted to feel blank. Or I would say, um, you guys, what, um, what do you think sets this series apart from other ones? So that's what you're trying to get at. You're trying to sort of trick them into telling you what specifically about your books are different than this romance author over here or this one over here. And I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but it it's, can be very difficult for a reader to tell you exactly what they loved about a book because it was that thing that I was telling you about earlier, that switch in your brain turns off that says um, you're reading fiction right now and they just feel like they're experiencing it. So they, the, it's very hard for them to put into words like, oh, I don't know, I just loved it so much. I, I just loved the hero. But when a reader didn't like a book, they can tell you exactly why. <laughs> because that switch was not flipped. Um, in and they were not anesthetized. And so they can say like, oh, this was boring. There was too much filler. The plot twist was ridiculous. This heroine was unlikable. Uh, so uh, that was, I got off on a tangent there. But so that's what you're looking for. You're looking for what makes your books different. Thanks. You're welcome. I have a boring question. What's the average length of your books? Um, I would say I always aim for 80,000 words. And usually they come out right about 82, 83, 84,000. My longest ever, I think, was 90. I almost died. <laughs> um, and my shortest, I think, was like 76,000. Do we get to everyone? Yeah. Two minutes. Yeah, so uh, normal people in my circle, when I talk about I'm an author, they're like, oh, they start mentioning famous authors, or are you in Barnes and Noble, things like that. They don't, know what, that question. they don't know what Kindle Unlimited is or anything thing like that. So my question is, we hear a lot of talk of going niche, 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 niche. Mm -hmm. uh, are we specifically talking about voracious Kindle Unlimited readers? Versus, let's question. say, people who follow an author or, or more general series or something like that? That's a great question. Um, I had never really thought about it like that, but I will admit, my readers are readers who read a book a day. And so I do think um, there could be something to that where if you write in a genre where readers aren't as voracious in Kindle Unlimited, let's say, consuming that book a day, um, maybe it's more like literary fiction or thrillers or, um, you know, that, that they just that take a little longer to read or maybe they read a book a, a month or a book a week or something like that. Um, I think then maybe, yeah, there, there might be room to appeal to a, a wider audience, but I don't know. I, I do think that um, drilling down as much as you can. I'm going to stand by that advice. Um, and romance, it's, it's easier for me to talk about because, um, or it's easier to do that, I should say, to drill down because, and maybe other genres are like this too, I'm not really sure. Romance is so broad, but then it has so many little subcategories that it is, it is easier to drill down. So I'm getting the wrap up. Um, so, but yeah, I, there is something to that. I had never really thought about that before, but in general, I would say picture that ideal reader and drill down as much as you can there. Yes, okay, 12 o'clock, class dismissed, go to lunch. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>